Okay, perfect. अच्छा तो ठीक है फिर जब भी आप रेडी हो थिंक वो मिनट दे देते हैं और हम जब भाई ने तो मैं ज्वाइन कर लिया Today we're going to study Surah Fatiha, the first surah, the first chapter of the Quran, and we can consider it to be the preface of the entire Quran. It's a, basically in just this entire chapter, which comprises of six verses, is a prayer. The prayer asking God uh, in this prayer, a person is asking God for guidance, and the God provides that guidance in the rest of the Quran. But we also need to keep uh, our eye, a close eye. That this surah lies in the first group of the Quran, as we know that the Quran comprises of seven different groups. So, in this first group, there are five surahs, five chapters: Surah Fatiha, Surah Bakra, Surah Al Imran, Surah Nisa, Surah Maida. The overall theme of this group is to convey the message of God, the uncorrupted, actual, real message of God, to the people of the book. The Jews and the Christians, the Ahle Kitab, the Bani Israel. On top of that, God has now given the title of Shahada Al Nas, the responsibility to convey the message of God to their cousins, Bani Ismail. As we know, it's a historical fact that Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was born in Bani Ismail. So when the title is reclaimed, taken away from somebody, but naturally they are told about the mistakes which they did in the past, because of which this, they are stripped off this responsibility and this title. So this is exactly what's going to happen in this group, that Jews and Christians will be told what they did wrong in the past, and the Muslims will now be given this responsibility the believers who are going to believe in Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, will be given this responsibility and they will be told what to do and what not to do. On top of that, they will also be told not to make the same mistakes that Jews or Christians did in the past. So this is the brief summary of uh, or overview of the first five chapters of Quran. Starting from Surah Fatiha, let's study. Bismillah Rahman Rahim. In the name of God, the most gracious, the ever merciful. The Quran contains a comprise of 114 chapters. Out of those 114 chapters, 113 chapters start with this very same verse. Bismillah Rahman Rahim. In the name of God, who's Rahman, the most gracious, who's Rahim, the most merciful. This verse is revealed as such by Allah Almighty to be put in front of every single chapter. But this verse in itself 
is not part of any chapter. This is an important point that which we need to keep in mind. We are not going to count this verse among the verses of Surah Fatiha, and we are not going to count this verse among the verses of any other chapter of Quran. So it's an isolated verse, which is revealed like any other verse in the Quran, but to be put in front of surahs. So that when you are going to start reading a surah, you shall start reading it after reciting this verse. This verse mentions three different you know, names of God. One is Allah. It's a very straightforward name. Ilah is what we normally call the Lord, the God. Al-Ilah means the God. It was a dedicated name of the one true God in Arabia. The word Rahman, most gracious, and the word Rahim, most merciful, they both reflect mercy, but with a subtle difference that the word Rahman reflects the depth of the mercy. To put it simply, God is infinitely merciful. This is what Rahman means for a layman. The word Rahim means that his infinite mercy is forever. It reflects continuity. Now, Surah Fatiha is a prayer. And when we're going to study it shortly, we will see that this prayer begins by acknowledging who God is. What is our relationship with that God? What is our purpose of life? And then asking God for something that is going to help us in achieving our purpose. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Gratitude is only for God. But naturally the word hum means to praise somebody. But when you praise somebody, if you are praising that person, with the intention of showing gratitude towards that person. If the qualities of that person, that being, are helping you out in your life, are giving you benefit, then your praise is not a mere statement. It's a way of showing gratitude that you're thankful to that person, to that being. So, this prayer begins with thanking God. Alhamdulillah. Who's the Lord of the universe? Ar Rahman, Ar Rahim, the most gracious, the ever merciful. Maliki Yomidin, he is the master of the day of judgment. So in these three verses, we are saying that, O oh Lord, our oh God, we are utterly thankful to you for all of your mercy, for all of your bounties. And we are very well aware that you haven't created us for nothing. Our creation is not for fun and playing games. It has a purpose. This life is a meaningful life. And based upon our deeds in this world, we will be answerable for them in the hereafter. So there is going to be a day when you will raise us all from death. You're going to ask us about our deeds and we will be answerable for every single one of our deeds. So this is how this prayer begins. Now try to put yourself in the shoes of the person who's praying in such a way. And try to think like the mindset of a person who's making this prayer. So the person recognizes 
and realizes that there is one God, that person understands the bounty and the merciful of the God, which the God has given him, which the God has bestowed upon him. The person also recognizes and realizes that his or her life is not a meaningless life. It's a meaningful life. And for this life, he's answerable to God. He will be answerable to God. On one day, that day will be the day of judgment. You alone we worship. You alone we seek help from. So if we recognize and realize that there is only one true God, then it would be utterly meaningless to worship anybody else. When we use the word worship, it doesn't merely mean to just offer some rituals, perform some rituals, like offering prayers or performing Hajj or Umrah, or fasting for God. All that is worship. But worship is more than that. It means that we bow down our head to the one true almighty God, and we submit our will to him. We are going to live this life the way he wants us to live this life. If he has set some rules, we are going to abide by those rules. If he wants us to abstain from something, we are going to abstain from those things. So our do's and our don'ts will be completely aligned with the will of God. What does the second part mean? And only your help we seek. So if there is one true almighty God about whom we are certain that he is the only one who has created everything, he didn't seek anybody's help, he didn't need anybody's help. And he not only created this universe and then sat back, he is running the show as well. He is monitoring the day-to-day -day activities, so to speak. And he is calling the shots, so to speak. And it's only his rule and his command that supersedes everything else. So if we don't if we believe in that, actually believe in that, then we are only going to worship him because it makes sense to only worship him. And we are only going to seek help from him. This part, we are only going to seek help from him at times confuse certain people. If I ask one of you, can you please give me some water because I'm thirsty? In a way, I'm seeking your help. Or if I'm stuck in my office work and I seek help of a colleague, am I doing something wrong? Not at all. Simplest answer I can give is that when you are in the midst of a prayer, you are praying to God. And in the midst of a prayer, you say, we only seek your help. That means, but naturally, 
that we are only going to pray to you. And if we want something by means that are beyond this materialistic world, we are only going to look up to you. These two things, I will repeat them. If I am praying, agar main dua manga, then I'm only going to pray to you. And if I seek assistance, help, guidance, that's up, up and beyond this materialistic world, then I'm only going to turn towards you. Only you can help me beyond the means of this world. I hope that this very extremely overly simplified explanation may help you in understanding this verse better. So, so far, I will repeat again that we recognize that there is only one true God. We recognize that he is the master and the Lord of the heavens and the earth. We recognize that he created everything and he is the only one who's running the show. He does not have any partners and nobody else has any say in running this universe. We also recognize that the God of this heavens and earth is extremely merciful, infinitely merciful, and his mercy is everlasting. We also recognize that he didn't create us without purpose. We know that we are here in this world to go through a test. His entire life is a test. And there is going to be a judgment day. Nobody knows when that day is going to come, but rest assured that it will come. And when that day is going to come, everybody will be answerable for their deeds, for every single deed. Now, if this life is a test and we want to be successful in this test, not just successful, obviously we want to pass it with flying colors then God is the only one who can guide us with absolute certainty that whosoever follows his guidance is never going to go astray. That person will never fail the test. And he's the only one who controls everything. So if anybody can listen to me, listen to my plea. Whenever I say it, whenever I think it, beyond the means of this materialistic world, it's the one true God. Only he has the power and authority to do anything and everything for that matter. So after realizing and recognizing all of this, and saying all of this out and loud. What am I asking God in this prayer? So far, I haven't asked anything. I just mentioned my beliefs. In Surah Fatiha, so far, I only said what I think to be true. In Dina Sirat al Guide me to the straight path. This is the prayer. This is what I'm asking for. A straight path that leads to work. Success. That takes me to a destination which is going to guarantee my success 
in the hereafter. Sirat al Lazina an Amda alayhi. Ghair al Mazdube alayhi. Walada alayhi. The path of those you have blessed. Obviously, if I'm making a prayer, I'm not the first person on this planet whom God is going to give guidance or who's seeking God's help, God's assistance towards the right path. Obviously, there have been people before me, before you, before all of us who seek God's guidance, who were guided by God, and many of them were pretty successful. Or at least we hope that. So we are saying, oh God, guide us towards the straight path. The path of those whom you have blessed. So whenever God is going to give guidance to somebody, and whenever God assists somebody, to do righteous deeds, to abstain from sins, to stay on the right path. And that is the real success according to Quran. And that's the way a person lives their entire life. And if their life ends that way, then they were blessed by God. They passed the test. They were utterly successful. This is Quranic definition of success. So I want to walk the same path of those people whom you guided and who were successful and who never go astray. But I don't want to follow the path of those who earned your wrath. Quran gives examples of nations who were initially blessed by God, but later, due to their rebellion against God, due to their breaking promises which they made to God due to their treachery, because of their treachery. Instead of receiving further blessings from God, the wrath of God befalls upon them. Jews are, as per Quran, an example of such a nation. Let me say it out and loud. When I say Jews, I'm talking about the Jews of the Quran, the Jews of the period of Moses, and the Jews of the periods of prophetic era. Those Jews who killed prophets, those who changed the message of Torah. It's not a generalization. Quran mentioned their names and Quran explicitly mentions that the wrath of God befalled upon them because of their deeds. So when we're going to study Quran and Quran mentioned these past incidents, obviously we're going to pay heed to it. Because we have to nasiyat hasil karne. We need to extract, take meaningful lessons out of the mistakes, from the mistakes of people of the past. If we are intelligent enough, we don't need to repeat those mistakes ourselves to reach to a conclusion which we can already extract from the mistakes of the previous generations. Not of those who have gone astray. So, according to Quran, 
one of the examples of people who have gone astray were the Christians. Very nice, again, not Christians of today, but of the past, of the prophetic era. These were the people who were given guidance by the prophet, who were given book by the prophets, but they exaggerated in their beliefs, in their article of faith, in their religion. So if you're going to rebel against God, the wrath of God is going to be fall upon you. May Allah have mercy on all of us. If you're going to exaggerate in your religion, at least you're going to stray from the right path. We don't want to do any of that. We would like to follow the path of those who were successful, who were blessed. In Surah Nisa, chapter 4, verse 69, if memory serves me right, Quran mentions their name. Ambiya, the prophets. Siddiqeen, people who always stand by the truth and speak the truth and speak for the truth even during the worst times. Shohada, people whose entire life is a witness to God. And even for God, if they have to give their lives, they do so. Salihin, righteous people, good moral human beings. So these are the examples of the people who have been blessed by God. So, this is the end of Surah Fatiha. I'm going to stop here. Uh, we are not going to study Surah Bakara today, but I would like to give a brief overview of what's discussed in Surah Bakara in the next chapter. And inshallah, God willing, next week, uh, we are going to study Surah Bakara. So Surah Bakra happens to be the longest chapter in the Quran, 286 verses. And it's a very interesting chapter in many ways. From our perspective, from the perspective of the people who believe in Prophet Muhammad, who are the Ummah of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. In this chapter, we are being told that now you are given the responsibility to receive the message of God from the prophet of God, apply it onto yourself and share this knowledge with the rest of the world. And we were also told that initially this responsibility was given to a certain group of people from the generation from the previous generations of different prophets and what kind of mistakes they did, they made. And not an exhaustive list, but a decent list, right? A sizable list is provided in this chapter from which we can take heed, we can ponder upon it and reflect upon it and evaluate and assess ourselves. Are we making the very same mistakes? And whenever we feel in life that we are making the same mistakes, we shall abstain from. We shall do correction, self-correction. Moreover, certain commandments were given to the Muslims for the first time in this chapter be those commandments related to the direction of prayer or fasting during the month of Ramadan, so on and so forth. 
And when these commandments, when we're going to study them in Surah Bakra, Surah Bakra very beautifully, very eloquently explains why we are doing these things. Well, even if Surah Bakra had not explained all of this, it's enough for us that we are servants of God. And that does not mean a human being. It means a servant. So we are here to serve God, right? Isn't it good enough for us that God has asked us to do these things? Of course it's good enough for us. But the God we, that we believe in, he is full of wisdom. Everything he says has an infinite amount of rational, tremendous amount of wisdom behind it. We may not understand it in totality, but still keeping our flawed, limited natures in mind, still we can extract or understand a lot, a lot. At least that's good enough for us. So each one of these commandments, the do's and don'ts mentioned in Surah Bakra, we will study them, but not just study the list. We're also going to study the rational behind all the do's and don'ts. Why we shall be doing something and why we shall abstain from something. And in Surah Bakra, it's extremely important. One of the messages that I would like to share in today's conversation that we are having, it doesn't matter who we are. It doesn't matter what my gender is, what my skin color is, uh, to which clan do I belong, whether I, I'm a royal or not, whether I, I live in city or in urban area, whether I'm born in 21st century or 4000 BC, none of that matters to God. The clear cut message of Surah Bakara is, that the only thing that holds weight in the sight of God is our deeds, our actions, our intentions. Whether we are a moral human being or an immoral human being. So if we are a moral person, we hold up to humanity, we do good deeds, this is or the only thing that God values. Doesn't matter if you are a descendant of a prophet. It's not my words, we will study it in Torah. Doesn't matter even if you are descendants of prophets. If you're not going to obey God, if you are not going to act as a decent, kind, loving, caring human being who has submitted his will to God, it, none of that will hold up on the day of judgment. Nothing else will hold up on the day of judgment. Not your wealth, not your beauty, not your clan, nothing. So the Quran is going to tell us in the very first chapter after Fatiha, because in Fatiha, the only thing we ask for is guidance. God, please guide us. We need to learn this basic principle right from the start. That nothing is going to help us on the day of judgment. The only thing that, that is going to matter are or will be our deeds. I will stop here. I think we have still have five, seven minutes. Uh, if there are any questions, please feel free to ask. Okay, one of the questioner asked, while well, talking about Jews and Christians, you have mentioned that this is about the past Christians and Jews of the time of the prophet. Can't we say the same thing about Jews and Christians of now? 
like the Jews of now are the and Christian of now are exaggerating and being <laughs> God has not given me the authority to make judgments on other people. Number one, why I'm using the word me, God has not given any of us the authority to judge other people. Everybody exaggerates. I'm sure there is no shortage of exaggeration among the Muslims as well. So let God decide who is right and who is wrong, who had the best of the intentions at heart and who was just doing it for a show off. I can only speak what is explicitly mentioned in Quran. Beyond that, I have no other authority. So people who killed prophets that were sent to them, the wrath of God befall upon them. I don't care about their country. I don't care about their uh, race. They did something that's mentioned in Quran and the decision of God is also mentioned in Quran. So this is, again, another important thing that we need to understand. We're going to study the book of God for our benefit, for our guidance, and out of love and care for humanity, we're going to share that knowledge with others. But at the same time, Quran said multiple times, even to Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, even to Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, that you are not a judge upon him. Because Prophet was so loving and caring, he was conveying the message of Quran to his audience and they rejected it after they truly believed it in their heart that the message is nothing but truth. And Prophet used to worry that if they are not going to listen to me, God is going to punish them. And God said, don't worry about it. All you need to do is convey the message of God and leave the rest to God. God gives guidance to everybody who deserves it. So no, I am not going to make any statement about any human being on the face of the planet because I am nobody to do so. Let God decide. And uh, it's also mentioned in Quran at various places that even at the time of Prophet, there were Jews and Christians who were extremely pious and righteous people. And Quran, verses were revealed in Quran at the time when those Jews and Christians still didn't accept the message of Islam. They did in later on, but at that time when those verses were revealed, they were still Jews and Christians. And Quran described some of their attributes, some of their qualities that they used to spend their nights praying to God, crying in front of him, asking forgiveness for their sins. They do good deeds. They are kind towards others, right? All that. And Quran said, God is not going to let any of their deeds go to waste. So what does that tell you? They are good and bad people in every community. Who's good and who's bad? That's exactly, <laughs> to decide that, that's exactly why God has set up a day of judgment. So let him do his job. Don't judge people. Please go ahead. Asalaamu Alaikum. Thank you so much, Razai, for a, for a beautiful explanation. This is Yasin here. Um, my question is, uh, sorry, can you hear me? Yes, I can. All right, thank you. Um, the question is, I'm always confused when we say that Quran starts with Ar-Fatiha, which is a dua for 
for some uh, from some people and the quran is the answer to that dua the whole dua in surah fatiha and who are these people who are asking this dua or asking not to be like the jews not to be like uh, the christians and they're not the mushrikeen so who are the, have we been able to identify whose dua is it? it it cannot be humanity's dua it has to be somewhere in in the context of makkah i'm, I'm, yes, I'm all, still confused about it go ahead please. thank you okay let me thank you thank you for the question let me share my limited understanding of sort of thought here first of all i i don't think the person who's making this prayer is directly saying i don't we don't want to be like jewel person or x or y right the person who's ever making this prayer has a realization and recognition that there is one god they understand that their creation is not meaningless we are not creating without purpose they recognize and realize that there is going to be a day of judgment and they want to be successful on that day so if they want to be successful on that day and they have all these set of beliefs in their heart at the back of their mind then they are seeking god's assistance help guidance to show them the path that is going to lead them to success and when you're going to say please show me the path that leads me to success but naturally you're going to say before me there there for surely or you're not going to be arrogant i'm not going to be arrogant i i will be the first person right who will walk on the right as well obviously there were people in the past who have walked this path so god just you know list me among those so that's another way of saying this mujhe bhi unme gin le just list me among those right just like they walk the right path i also want to walk the right path and for surely if we have sinners in our time if we have bad people in our time if we have rebellious people in our time there were people in the past as well so i don't want to be like those people who you dislike god or who were dishonest to you who you have showed the path but then they go astray so it's a prayer of a human being who recognizes and realizes god their the purpose of their existence but i'm not very sure that how they can you know achieve their purpose they want to know the way of life which is aligned with the purpose of their existence now when i said that it surah fatiha mentions people who face the wrath of god quran gave jews as an example of those people they were not the only people who face the wrath of god so when you going to give example of something a community so let's spend one more minute of this why specifically jews why didn't quran give example of people or nation or somebody else for that matter yes sir who were the direct audience who were your neighbors people jews were those people polytheists of arabia or the arabians of prophet muhammad's time they were very well aware of who jews were they were very well aware of who christians were they were very well aware of who come are the come smooth was so they knew these their people they knew these communities so they were given examples of communities whom they were very well aware of about their mistakes about the mistakes of those communities that it's just like telling you and me see you have a neighbor you know him and i will say Yes, yes, see, I know him very well. He has this ten very good qualities, but you are aware of these two, three things that he normally do, his bad habits, and their consequences. Just try to refrain from them, from from having these bad habits. So that's my answer. 
that Surah Fatiha is just a prayer of any human being, any human being who, whether through observing this world, recognizes and realizes that there must be a God and our existence is not without a purpose, but I'm not very sure what I'm supposed to do or how, what kind of life shall I live that is going to lead to me to success. That's my answer. I can be right, I can be wrong, but that's my limited understanding of so far. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for a wonderful explanation. Over to Amar. Thank you. I think we have one more question in our chat. Uh, or is it a comment? I'm trying. Okay. Uh, somebody says that uh, without reading everything, that Prophet started receiving revelations and the revelation stopped, then he he was given Surah Fatiha, which is a prayer to, to seek guidance, to get guidance from God. He made this prayer and hopefully further revelations were given. Very briefly, let me tell you my understanding of Quran, and this is something that I learned from Javed Amin Gandhi himself. These things that are called Shan and Zul, when a verse or chapter was revealed, it doesn't matter. Why? Because if it mattered, why Quran was not compiled in the sequence in which it was revealed? So we know that Surah Bakra is not the chapter that was revealed after Fatih. It's a Madni Surah that was revealed almost 13 years into prophethood. So right in the beginning, you're seeking God for guidance. And the first chapter that the Quran has put in front of you does not discuss the first 13 years of prophethood. So the Quran is compiled in this particular way in which we see it in front of us by Almighty God because of a reason. The revelation order Shani Nazul doesn't matter. The Quran that we have in front of us right now, we're going to read that Quran, we're going to understand that Quran, and we're going to explain that Quran in the shape and form that it exists in front of us or that God chose for us. This sequence, this order, the context of the Quran is now going to be defined with the sequence of the verses in which it exists today. So for me, if Surah Fatiha was revealed, hypothetically, let's assume it's true, that Prophet stopped receiving revelation and then he was given a prayer, okay, ask for guidance and I'm going to give you guidance. Okay, let's assume it was true. Why it matters? Why didn't Quran put the revelations first, which Prophet received before Fatiha, after which the process of revelation stopped temporarily, and then God asked Prophet Muhammad to seek guidance. So that's not how Javed Ahmed Gandhi or Shahzad Salim or all my teachers, right? <laughs> not even Mulana Madhuri in that sense, right? Uh, the great scholars. But that's not how they see Quran. Uh, I think the best way to see Quran is the way it is at the moment. And there are more than, I'm not giving you an exact figure, there are more than 6,000 verses in Quran. More than that, right? And the Shan and Azul of a handful of verses are mentioned in the literature, be it Hadith or otherwise. What about the rest of the 5,500 verses? Oh, if we don't know their Shan and Azul, what are we going to do with it? It's not required. It's not part of the Quran. It's not divine. And it doesn't matter. When the God changed the compilation, when the God changed the sequence of the verses, then it was God's will 
that we shall focus on the sequence uh, in which it has been put in front of us. The sequence of revelation holds no meaning uh, in Quran anymore. But it was a great question. Thank you. Uh, any other questions uh, from anyone? I think um, yeah, we don't have any any more questions. Um, so thank you for a beautiful lecture today, Shazve. Uh, certainly benefit from it. I think uh, the other participants can share the same view as well. Uh, and I look forward to your lecture next Saturday. Uh, same time, same place. Uh, and I think uh, we can call it a day then. I don't have any more questions. Thank, thank you, you everybody. May I bless all of you. Remember us in my prayers. Thank you very much. Allah Hafiz.